job, which is not typically manually these days, but let's for the sake of example. And we are going to build an automation kind of a robo arm, which will be responsible to profile the tar surfaces, decide on a certain paint kind of a mixture, and then apply it. Yeah. Okay. So we are going for an automation. So prior to that, guys, uh, once we have decided that we are going to do that, first of all, we will start off with an analysis phase. Yeah. Now this phase is basically an analysis about what does it exist on the shop floor as of today and where are we going to, okay, when we are going to do this automation. So let's say today where we are, let's call it as this. Tomorrow where we are going to be, let's call it 2B. So this delta differential between as is and 2B is what is called the analysis part, which means we map how the things are done today. What is the process for that? What is the process flow for that? What are those events and various intervals in that process flow which we may like to automate, okay, so that the overall process turns efficient and that's what we will call an enhanced process. Now, the difference between as is and to be is what Rajesh would like to analyze. Okay. First of all, he would, as a business analyst typically, he would like to map that which industry is this, what are the benchmarks set up for that kind of an industry for automation? Yeah. What is the current cost cycle of doing the same job manually? And what are the basically efforts going into it? What are the associated related other costs going into it, etc.? That's part one. Part two, Rajesh would interact with some of the client side business people who want to as basically get this automation done. So it's a requirement, it's a demand which has come from that side. Rajesh should get into a detailed analysis with such people and such people we would call stakeholders. So Rajesh is likely to handhold his stakeholders in terms of all kind of discussions which will be related to understanding the as is and then fitting in the requirements which have come in with respect to automation. So currently everything is manual. So Rajesh first evaluates the entire process. He first lays out the entire process. Probably even the documentation is not available. So he discusses with the stakeholders who are shop floor people who have been there for a couple of years who know the process as it exists today. So Rajesh needs those stakeholders to map the entire process in order to evaluate what is the current effort going behind to run that process today? What is the related cost? why this kind of automation is required and if it is required it's going to be done at what points of the process yeah? unless he's automating the every single process step itself yeah? that's what we call analysis analysis is guys generally done by the ba only which means the ba would like to do an as a center to be analysis he will be supported by his it teams and who are these it teams the it teams are who are basically designers who are basically implementer, implementers, which means they do coding, testing for that part of technology. So let's say Rajesh is using a specific technology. Now that decision he may not take, but looking at the requirements with which he's with the requirements which he is soliciting from his stakeholders, Rajesh would like to put it openly in front of a drawing board. And then his IT team in form of a technical designer, in form of a functional configurator, in form of a coder, in form of a tester, in form of a project manager. So they will all huddle together with Rajesh and try to make an assessment that these requirements necessitate what kind of solution. Yeah, so good for now. Are you getting it guys? Okay. All right, I'll take it as a yes. So after that, the analysis part is full accountability of the business analyst. So for example, in some of the courses that Imarticus offers, we train people who are coming from various domains who necessarily are not IT people. Yeah. So this course is designed to upscale your understanding and it's like a certification for you to, to, to do this business analysis part so that you become a qualified business analyst. Now if I say business analyst, the name itself suggests that he or she has to be proficient on the business cycle. Yeah. So necessarily, you don't have to be diligent on the IT side. If you are, it's good to have. If you are not, that is not a major roadblock in you guys becoming a business analyst, successful ones tomorrow. So our, the, so the programs which are offered by Marticus are designed to 
upscale people coming from various domains. Now, what are these various domains? For example, somebody might be coming from pure sales. Somebody might be coming from manufacturing and procurement cycle. Yeah. Somebody might be coming from banking. Somebody might be coming from financial services. Yeah. So, based on the depth of understanding which they have in their respective domains, we train them to learn the business analysis part, which means we just add one extra value step to them. And this is the step which Rajesh gains in terms of understanding the business perspective, in terms of understanding the assets, in terms of evaluating a possible to be, in terms of handling his stakeholders, in terms of using various tools and techniques to solicit these things what we call requirements. So what are these requirements? These requirements are with respect to automation. These requirements are with respect to bringing in a new technology which can take out the redundant process of manual business as of today and it can install the automated process as of tomorrow. Yeah. So this whole analysis in terms of cost, in terms of benefits, in terms of risk, in terms of challenges, yeah, this is all what is going to be done by our diligent business analyst Rajesh. Rajesh typically may spend 10 to 15 percent of the project timeline in doing this analysis part. Yeah, for example, if it is a hundred or a thousand mandate project, Rajesh typically gets about hundred mandates. Yeah, to do this kind of analysis, these the analysis guys is very deep. It's very very evaluative in terms of arriving at five to six different answers. One, what Rajesh is trying to do as per the requirement of the business guys in terms of automation, is that worth it? Number two, is it worth it only from a cost benefit perspective or is it also worth taking that risk? Because if you are trying to shape up any current technology landscape, it will logically bring in some risks as well. Many of the businesses do not agree to that risk after that they see the evaluation of the business analyst. It's possible because they don't want to change their existing setup even at the cost of compromising the efficiency. But never mind, we will let that decision be dependent on the business stakeholders whom Rajesh is currently going to handle. Yep. Now, in order to arrive at a 2B solution, Rajesh has to overlap himself with his IT team because these IT teams have those designers they have those yeah. editors, they have those software developers who have either done this kind of enhancement before for the same industry or for a different industry or they can definitely offer at least a diligent viewpoint that what are the possible softwares which can be used in this requirement in order to achieve that as a final product. Yeah. So this is the dope which they will fill Rajesh with while he's having his interactions with the stakeholders. Yeah. So that is how through various techniques of let's say uh, workshops, joint workshops with the client people and IT people, let's call them kind of a typical interview session which Rajesh is going to hold for his stakeholders in order to arrive at the true requirements. Let's call it probably Rajesh interaction with industry experts. We also call it focus group study. This means that Rajesh might like to approach some of the auto industry automation experts and ask their viewpoint about doing this automation for this particular client of his. Yeah. All put together, Rajesh is going to arrive at a certain conclusion. He is going to bounce off that conclusion with his stakeholders. All right. And then with the joint consensus, which is basically taken after arriving at a cost benefit analysis, and they can clearly see that yes, there is a large benefit in automating our current pain shop. If that is true, then they give it a go ahead and then the project shifts from analysis to design phase. Yeah. Now design is typically the phase where the architect, designers, software experts or software configurators are going to write some kind of a uh, functional specification. Right. And then after that is given a go ahead, they are going to put it into the programmers lab. Programmers, of course, who are going to write the programming or some kind of a programming language, anyone which they would use associated with that technology or that software, so as to achieve certain desired customization. So, guys, let's understand two things as you may or like to enter IT tomorrow. We have some generic softwares in the market, and then those generic softwares are 
probably good as solutions, but it does not probably apply to the exact solution what the client needs from this IT software product. So this means while Rajesh may like to evaluate those softwares and see that all right, 70% they are close fitment of the solution which the client needs, but 30% of customization is still needs to be done. So what we can do is we can probably get that product software off the shelf from the market, but then Rajesh would hand over that product to his programmers. Programmers would like to write certain technical specifications because they want to customize this product according to the client for which Rajesh and the IT teams are working as of today. This is what we achieve largely through programming languages. So in programming, we write certain, you know, we write certain functional modules, uh, you know, we can write certain codes which help us to achieve that customization which the user tomorrow is going to see on screen when he is going to use this 2B product onto the new shop floor. Yep. So hence, this is what we call build and this build means programming and doing brief testing which we call unit testing. Then the software products need to be tested. And obviously, testing is the only filter gate guy where we can cross-check and checkmate whether all the desired functionalities which we need to bring into the software product, are they being, are they functionally successfully functioning or not? Testing is of various types. It's basically as simple as the unit testing where we test the line item of the code that we have written. It could largely go into functional testing. It can go into integration testing, it can go into stress testing, it can go into system testing, it can go into regression testing, and so on and on. So the length of testing, length list, lengthy list of testing could be as much as you want. So these testings intend to test whether the functionality, number one, is working well. Two, whether this functionality jointly with the other functionalities is working well. This means you are automating something for the paint shop. But the paint shop is where some material from the procurement arrives. So now your user is first procuring those material in the system. Material arrives at the shop floor and then it is sent to the, to the paint shop. Now the integration of procurement cycle with the paint cycle is something which will be already inbuilt into your system. Now whether when you are automating the paint cycle, does that automated painting cycle integrate as well as with the procurement cycle? That's what we need to check. And this is called integration cycle. As the word suggests, it integrates two functionalities for a proper thorough end-to-end -end check. Yeah? All right. So integration test, and then we say, okay, we give it to the user for you. The user acceptance test. Many tests are involved, right? Think about it, guys. We need to come through all the testing cycles completely. Now, as I'm talking, I might like to say that, guys, the business analyst is sitting entirely through this whole life cycle and it's not that after completing his analysis, he is done for. Don't forget that business analyst Rajesh here was the prime guy who understood the requirements from the business side. Business guy. He is the one who understands their assets. He is the one who understands and who understood and hence gave the solution for 2B. So at any stage in the product life cycle, whether it is designing, the designers would like to have business analysts sitting next to them. When it goes into implementation, that is build, the programming guys might have a certain queries which backtrack all the way to the requirement. Hence, the BA needs to be sitting along. Testing. In testing, BA himself helps the testers to create test plans based on the requirements which initially came and based on the requirements design was made, based on the design, the code was written, based on the code, the testing is going on. So you can see guys, business analysis is inherently linked to all phases of the product life cycle. Yeah? Okay. Post-testing, we are ready to deploy that and if the user access and testing comes through successfully, the product is ready to be deployed. This is, guys, what is typically the different phases of software development life cycle. Yeah? I think what we can do is we can go through these slides here, one by one, and I can take all your questions towards the end. Okay? So now, can you shift to the next slide, please? Okay, so guys, this is just another view, okay, where Rajesh did the requirement analysis as step one. Once the requirements were understood, we wrote the 2B design. Once the design was okay, we gave it to the programmers or the configurators to do the needful. Configuration guys, they 
did the configuration for that software. Yeah, if the standard software was not enough, so they customized it. Part two, we gave it to the coders because specific customization was not achieved through configuration. So the code guys wrote codes in for that, and that's what we call completion of implementation cycle. Then it went into testing, and after testing, it went into deployment. Now, why is the last phase not called deployment? What is called evolution? That is because once the software product comes into practice, yeah, the users at the soft shop floor can use it. Slowly, the business understands that there probably there's a need to enhance that product a little bit more. There could be so many reasons for it. Maybe competitive pressures, yeah. So a competitive uh, car company is turning around the whole paint business, let's say in less than three hours. And the client for which we have made this automation is still taking five hours after the automation cycle. This means in order to be competitive, in order to reduce our time to market, we need to enhance and hence evolve our product. That will kick off, guys, another round of project cycle where new requirements will come in because now we want to crash the paint time from five hours to three hours or even more. So then Rajesh will be again solicited Again, Rajesh will have discussion with his stakeholders. New requirements will come in in terms of crashing the timeline, which means what? Which means the automation has to work faster, which means the RoboArm has to do diligent paint job, but in a lesser period of time, right? So we need to enhance the speed. So how we will do that will be the evolution of this product. And after evolution, it goes back into deployment. This is, guys, the larger software development or uh, what we call system development life cycle, which goes on and on and on till the time we are able to evolve the product to the highest level of competitiveness. Yeah. Okay. Pranash, next slide, please. Guys, this view should be very interesting for you. I built this view because I wanted to plot not only the different phases, I wanted to tell Rajesh that what are the various deliverables at different points of time, guys? So see, this is typically what is called a V model, yeah? So it's typically in shape of a V. But the storyline it follows is pretty much what we followed earlier. First, the requirement perspective came in, and based on that, Rajesh wrote a deliverable called BRD. Guys, this is the prime deliverable expected from a business analyst. In this business requirement document, BRD, he captures everything what I told you guys earlier. He assesses the as is, he analyzes what could be a possible to be, he does a cost analysis, benefit analysis, risk analysis, challenges, and so many other things. He captures all kind of requirements which have he has understood in terms of shaping up this to be product. Yep. So all different kind of requirements are captured. Requirement from the shop floor guys, requirement from the IT guys, requirement from very particular business guys. So all kind of user requirements, non-user requirements, quality related requirements, etc., etc., are, you know, taken in. So all that thing is put into a single Bible called BRD. This was the prime deliverable from Rajesh's side. Once the BRD is approved, Rajesh hands over the BRD to the technical or the functional designers. And that's what we call, hey guys, we are going to redesign the business process itself. And the reason is clear. It was pretty manual. We are going to automate that. Yeah. So once the business design is settled, now we need to write certain specs for it, right? Why is the specs needed? Because, oh, all right, great. So we are going to achieve this in the design. Sounds good. But how are we going to achieve this? How much is going to come from the software reconfiguration, how much is going to come from software reprogramming is something for which we need specifications. Yeah. So the functional guys will write functional specifications and the programmers will write technical specifications. Combination of these two will lead to the build cycle, which means functional configurators will change the software configuration. Programmers will change the basic programming itself. Once that is achieved, it goes into a simple unit test called, basically it's a test for the code that you have written afresh. These three cycles are basically called the build cycle. Yeah. So post design guys, we step into build, which means we write functional spec, text spec build and unit test. Your build cycle is complete. 
and then we step into testing. After the testing is gone through, as many years testing that you want to have, but don't forget guys, IT is very cautious, cost conscious these days. So even though they have to test the product very thoroughly, they still have to make sure the testing doesn't take a very long time. Which means what? Which means that IT has automated its test cases, test plans, test strategies itself as well. So as I sit in an IT company today, and I oversee such implementations, etc., etc., I may like to tell you guys that end-to-end, -end, most of the things are very, very automated today, except for the basic part called analysis and the business process design. Rest of the things are fairly automated. Yeah. After this automation, obviously, the cycle time of a product development has crashed significantly. So earlier, where we used to develop these products, you know, in a long cycle of let's say thousand days, today we take probably five to six hundred days. So the IT timelines have crashed by forty percent, and the reason is clear: there are automated test cases, test plans. There is automated build cycles. There are automated ways to quickly write the technical specification by leveraging on similar tech specs which e came earlier into this kind of an SDLC. Yeah, okay. So after that, guys, testing is complete, it goes into deployment. Overall, this is called the V model, which suggests what phases, who is involved. So for example, here, this is the VA, and here is the technical architect. Here, there are functional specs, guys. Here, they are programmers, and here, they are pure testers. If you belong to a certain domain and you want to enter the IT cycle, you are likely to land here. Unless you want to learn certain programming or you want to do a, you know, a certification in, let's say, a particular technology called SAP, for example. So let me tell you something about myself, guys. I, maybe a couple of years back, I was from sales domain. I did my business analysis and I landed here. After landing here, the IT guys took me into IT training and then they made me learn SAP. Then I became an SAP functional expert as well. Yeah, so then I was performing these three roles. The business analyst, including the functional analyst, right? So if you are a complete raw rookie, what I was probably 12 to 12 years earlier, then via the business analyst program, you can safely step into the IT cycle if you are completely non-IT person, yeah? Okay, and then significantly is what you will learn more by being into this V curve, and when the learning increases, you increase your foothold into the IT cycle, right? So you come in as a BA, and then you become designer, sometimes you're writing specifications, yeah. anytime yeah. you're Any writing test yeah. cases, test plan, and you, so you are a significant contributor to the IT life cycle. That's the life of a BA. Yeah? Okay. Sanaz, next slide, please. So, guys, this is pretty much what I was describing the V model as. So, we initiate, we bring in a system concept development, we plan for it, and after this planning, the BA steps in at a requirement analysis phase. So, what you can, what you read here is primarily what, you know, while probably I was trying to articulate that what do we do exactly in these different phases? Yep. So now next slide. Okay. If you may like to read, maybe we can just quickly go through this. So guys, development is somewhere you convert a design. Remember the design which either a design architect gave uh, or what the functional specs guys gave. We convert the design into a complete IT system. Yeah. Which means we create the environment, we create the testing databases. We create test case procedures, et cetera, et cetera. We do coding, we refine the codes program, we perform tests, et cetera, to review. This is all part of development. So development doesn't necessarily mean, guys, that only coders are active, right? So in any case, software development lifecycle is a very, very joint effort of multiple skilled people. So don't think that at a certain stage, only one skill is active. IT is basically the largest kind of a, you know, conjointness where multiple skills comes together, fuse themselves, and then give a very, very good output in terms of leveraging each other's expertise. So what are these expertise? Business analysts, functional designers, testers, coders, etc., etc. Right? Okay. So now, next slide, please. 
Guys, I want to give you something more contemporary now. Yeah. So I want to primarily take you through different kind of SDLC. So you learned about a bit about what is the software development life cycle. So let me tell you guys, SDLC itself has pinned out now into multiple varieties. Yeah. The earlier part of S the, the way we used to execute SDLC in all the previous two decades was largely called a waterfall, waterfall type of SDLC. And then business demands necessitated that we speed up by pulling our socks as well. So while these guys sat in IT, we developed a different concept of development of these products. We called that agile. As the name suggests, it is basically the speed at which the product is developed. Yeah. So waterfall is a traditional methodology. Agile or iterative or incremental are more new generation methodologies for carrying out your SDLC. Yeah. So let me tell now take you into detail that how you used to do waterfall and how do we do agile now in order to crash the timeline for the product to develop faster so that it can be taken to market faster. A very simple example, Airtel and Vodafone. So Airtel and Vodafone are two cell phone companies. They keep changing their product feature of their services every, almost every week. What do you think guys is happening? They have a very good set of project teams. So let's say today Vodafone wants to add an additional feature into its product portfolio for its client or its customers, right? So for example, I am a Vodafone customer. Now Vodafone starts offering me an additional bandwidth of data download, you know, within a certain, uh, you know, extra uh, kind of a money to be paid during a month. Let's call it a new feature. Now you know this cell phone market, very, very competitive between the service providers. So Vodafone has offered this services into, uh, into the market, but before that it was building up that feature into its software product or its software services in this case. Yeah. So when it launched this scheme, Airtel will not be behind. It will immediately replicate this feature. But to replicate this feature, guys, he has to build that feature into its software services. That's when, guys, he's got very little time. And hence, he will probably try to typically pick up the agile methodologies for his project team in order to execute this software configuration in its system so that tomorrow the Airtel guys at their franchisees can offer the services to customers and achieve that thing in the system or in the software as well, right? Because it needs to go into the system. So this is the typical example, guys, why agile methodologies came into practice. Yeah, let's see what they are. So now next slide, please. So guys, waterfall was like that. It was a sequential approach. You will finish one thing, only then the next phase will begin. So for example, First, the business analyst will complete its, you know, its whole analysis. Only after that, it will go into designing. Once the complete design is written, only after that, it will go into functional configuration and coding. When the coding completely finishes and it's signed off, it goes into testing. So as you understand, the focus is on completing one first phase in 100% total, without which it doesn't step into the next phase. So well, I will call it a good way of doing project methodology. So the good thing is guys, it's very focused. Unless one phase finishes, the second phase doesn't start. That's great. But please understand that while you employ this methodology, you are increasing your time of software development. What if, while Rajesh was probably building the requirements, at least the initial requirements which were built could be dropped into the design cycle so that it could be quickly designed and then dropped completely into the coding cycle. Completely coded, dropped into testing cycle. While this is happening, Rajesh is bringing in the next set of requirements which he's now getting from his stakeholders. So what did we do? We just made sure that we do not stand at the gate of the house and we don't enter till the time we are completely done with phase one. We enter the gate with something so that we can hand it over to the next person. 
all right while we await more requirements from rajesh we are not going to so this means guys designers testers configurators they are not sitting idle the first set of requirements which came in they immediately took them under their kitty and they started developing designs for it and they started configuring it yeah so what did happen what happened that a slow and steady form of channel was opened by rajesh few requirements were thrown out which the project teams picked up and started doing all right so this is what i may like to say hey that's a fast way to way of developing a software so agile as the dictionary says mean fast so i'll say all right that's an agile way of development right but if in a typical waterfall and guys waterfall has its own strong point we use waterfall for last something like 2 to 3 decades to develop every small requirement every medium requirement and very very large projects as well we wanted to be risk free so we said we are not going to move ahead till the time one phase is completely completed i called it waterfall so as the water falls from a height to a low height just like that the water falls gets into sequences so first phase finishes then falls forward second phase finishes falls downward third phase finishes and on and on traditional way of developing projects while it used to do a good job guys but there used to be some big problem coming up if rajesh gave us wrong requirements for some reason at the beginning we waited till the time all requirements came in and then we started writing designs for it then we started developing them as codes so we carried that incorrectness with us all along the way that was a big risk for which we realized that waterfall was also the not the most efficient way of doing project methodology besides that it was not fast enough and today vodafone and airtel are demanding very fast time to market what do i do i have to shift to agile right so then we decided to give waterfall a little break then our next slide please okay so just another view of waterfall guys so rajesh did requirement analysis then he elicited the requirement then we gave it to design then coding and then production deployment etc etc nobody moved till the time he got complete inputs from the previous guy right that was the problem with with, with waterfall methodology yeah okay so this is waterfall so tanav let's go to next slide okay very quickly strengths of waterfall well it's easy to understand so nothing moves before you understand the whole thing right so requirements are fully understood and then they are handed code code guide right okay well even if everybody is not so experienced no worries i can even keep some inexperienced people into the larger team even they can work under the guidance of senior people so waterfall gave me a chance to save my it cost as well yeah so so everything was going fine till the time airtel came to me and said hey guys we can't afford 50 days to develop this product which i am trying to complete with vodafone now you have 10 days to develop this then it was time guys we changed from waterfall to agile so then now let's go to the next slide and see what is agile all right you understood the weaknesses of waterfall right if some risk is inbuilt it will carry on right till the end unless entire requirements are known up front you can't do design you will not do design right etc etc so that was the weakness all right so now let's go to the next slide okay so then i bought in something called agile right so in agile guys the model does not build everything at once but it develops that product step by step that's what i call the incremental cycle yeah this means unlike a more traditional waterfall approach agile development is based on step by step development right so you execute agile in small steps which means you do not take very large projects into agile mode you pick up small to medium changes you take break them down into sub components you try to achieve sub components one by one and that's how you build up the overall component of the software development but since you are doing small components you are likely not going to go wrong since you are doing small components you don't really need an exhaustive information to start working in the phase that you are sitting in So you understood? I just made the model a little lighter, a little more flexible. That was all what we needed, guys, to put it into agile mode. Yeah. Okay. Then now next slide. 
So look at the beauty of agile, thing, uh, agile methodology, guys. Rajesh bring the requirement. We drop it into architecture and design. If that doesn't seem to be working well, I, we immediately give it back to requirement. So this iteration continues between these two guys till the time requirements are completely done and the designs are developed. Right? Now you remember waterfall? In waterfall, requirement guys will complete his perspective and then dump the you know over to the design guys and telling them, hey guys, I'm off to a vacation. Right? But here, requirement, which means the BA, is sitting next to the design guy. Design guys are sitting next to the code guys. So everybody overlaps within each other very, very quickly in case there is any roadblock in terms of development of either the design, so design guy will immediately overlap with BA, or they will immediately overlap with development guy. So small components are developed and thrown over, you know, into the next phase, and that's how the cycle continues in smaller steps, but in faster steps, right? So that's fine, guys. I'll bro break open a larger component into smaller subcomponents, and I'll keep putting that into the funnel. In my funnel are good people sitting in form of business analysts, designers, coders, testers. So they'll keep picking up that small, 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 small design and continually keep developing it with the help of each other. While the small components keep generating themselves into final products, you are eventually building up the stack of subcomponents to give them the full cycle product. Yeah, risk is less because you had a better control. Why you had a better control? Because your components were small, easy to understand, flexible to be made and designed, easy to code, quick to test. You got it, guys? That is the beauty of Agile. Okay, Tanaz, next slide, please. So, guys, let me show you what it is like sitting in an Agile ecosystem. In Agile ecosystem, guys, we have the environment, which means we have the server system. We have the development servers typically in which we can continually develop the product in terms of configuration or coding. Okay. Physical part. Physical is part is guys that always agile is done in a in a in a in a room where ev entire IT team is closely uh, located, which means business analyst, designer, project manager, tester, coder, everybody is going to be sitting face to face in the same room. Yeah. Now, if you say, hey, Mukraj, this is going to be an onshore offshore model. So, what we do is we set up very advanced audio video conference rooms for these teams. Onshore guys from the client side sit at onshore. Offshore guys, let's say, sit in India. Every morning, they switch on their audio and videos. They look at each other like the way we are looking at each other. We discuss requirements, we discuss designs, we discuss coding. And that's how the continual overlap every single day between the various skill sets in the single team helps to design products faster. Yep, that's the whole magic of Agile. Yep, and obviously you are sitting together, you are co-located, etc. So obviously the communications are very fast. Nobody has a misunderstanding because if I have a misunderstanding, I'm going to immediately catch hold of Rajesh who's sitting next to me. And Rajesh is continually helping to evolve more requirements, help the designer to understand those requirements so that they can write better designs. It's uninterrupted, there is no roadblock, people have easy access to each other's skill set, and hence the joint synergy guys which gets developed is great. That's the magic of Agile. So now next slide please. Okay, so look at this guys. How I want to transform a waterfall into an Agile. So in typical Agile, a waterfall mode, I had, you know, design teams, Build team, system team, QA team, etc. Yep. Now, if I want, if I say, hey guys, this was a team of 50 people. Let's say assume 10 designers, 10 business analysts, 10 coders, 10 testers, and that constitutes 50 people. Yeah. What I did, guys, I separated out those teams, and what I did, I made small, small feature teams, which means I want a team of 10 people instead of 50 to lead feature one of that product. I made another team of 10 people, I want to lead them feature two. Feature one was automating one component. Feature two was automating the second component. And that's how I built five teams of 10 people each. Gave them separate set of requirements. Many requirements are to can be developed in parallel. Yeah, 
So guys, I just reshaped 50 people into five teams of 10 each. I gave them that kind of a work in which requirements are not to be built sequentially. Hence, they can work independent of each other. Each team has the same mix of skills. So each team has business analysts, designers, testers, coders, etc. So in the parallel working that they achieve, they can obviously develop the product for Airtel faster rather than in a waterfall model. Yep. So guys, this, you remember when we used to be, maybe even still some of us do sprints. So I say, hey Rajesh, come, let me challenge you to a 100 meter sprint. So a sprint is a very short dash from start line to end line. Just like that guy, I designed multiple sprints, which means I said in sprint cycle number one, we will develop so and so kind of features of this product. Sprint cycle two, sprint cycle three and so on. And once I combine these sprints, I call them a single thing called scrum. So guys, if you may like to get familiar with these words, sprints are the smaller set of cycles which we run in an agile mode to develop the larger product. And a combination of these kind of sprints, it's what we call a scrum. Yeah. So your automation was developed in this scrum in which there were same 50 number of teams. So you did not reduce the team size in agile compared to your waterfall. But you just made sure that because they are not sequentially dependent on each other, you ended up doing more work than waterfall. So Airtel got its products before than the expected time. And that's all what brings you bring in via agile. Yep. Okay, so guys, I think we have 10 minutes left, so I would love to welcome some questions. If you can please publish your question in the chat window, I'll read that and I would like to then answer your question. Any question which you may have, whether you are in IT or non-IT, whether you are a BA or you want to be a BA, whether you want to get associated with IT in any way or form, any query, clarities, any queries you may have guys, I'll be happy to answer. So guys, I mean, just in general, I mean, when we say, hey, I want to enter an IT career, you know, this is what you all you need to understand on a high level when you take a decision that I want to come forward. I want to get associated with the IT part, you know, in some way or so. I did that 12 years back, and then I, you know, became, I became a BA, then that's how I came in. Then I became a functional designer, and then I, you know, started leading some teams, and then on and on and on. So, I mean, if you are outside, sitting outside the IT, you know, view level, let's say that it's pretty exciting. And guys, this word runs on software. Yeah. So this word is going to always need either a standard software or a customized software. It's going to need various technologies to develop that software. It will need skill set like business analyst, functional designer, tester, whatever. To keep doing that job for itself. So, I mean, as a career, I guess not too bad. So guys, I, re I read this question, for example, from Raj, it says, if some, in any case, if something goes wrong in waterfall, do we have the option to go back? Yes, Raj. So we find out during coding or testing that something has you know, really gone wrong, we can go back and we will go back, but it's just that it will be a very expensive exercise. Because you wrote, some, let's say we wrote some kind of a wrong design. It traveled to coding, wrong codes was, you know, managed. Then it traveled to testing, and then the test cases failed and then we realized something was wrong. So waterfall is fine. We have been doing waterfall for the last 20 years now. But it's just that it turns out to be more and more expensive proposition to use waterfall in peace. Yep. So Anikit says, where are those stages where BA is very important in SDLC? So Anikit, the broad answer is, uh, BA, BA is active throughout the project life cycle. I will not deny that his, significant, his significance of his role is very, very high during the first phase. This is the business analysis phase. But significance does not significantly go lower down into the build and test and further stages. Yeah? Because for one reason, BA was the inception point of these requirements. He understood it and he helped it to design. And if something goes wrong, he, it's always retraced back all the way to the requirements. Yeah? And that's how, you know, it, it makes sense for the BA to remain with the, and that's how, you know, obviously they are well-respected people, they are sports projects like that, so they are there, they interact with clients the most, and, you know, they are the six points of contact between the IT teams and the business teams. Very, very significant people, yeah. So, 
Okay, so you say is there a scope for people moving from telecom core experience is more than 15 years? Yes. So you thanks to your domain experience of telecom, you can provide prove to be a very valuable person, especially if you are a business analyst. Now, thanks to your telecom domain experience, you will know the telecom processes. You will know that what is critical and what is not. You will know what brings risks and what doesn't. And this is exactly the value which the IT cycle needs from people like you. Mind you, I had already done a domain experience of several eight years before you know I started stepping into the IT as a VA. So I am glad I did because the domain experience never went wrong. It was a very crucial input which, uh, which could be given. That's why you know business analysts are largely also very much welcome in case they are from a domain experience. Yeah, afterwards I can slow down a bit, no worries. That's fine, Rajesh. It works. It works everywhere. Where the changes be different or not different. It is just that it's a methodology of development. In this methodology, we normally work closely with client people hand in hand. So we need to, you know, probably twist our mindset and change our culture the way we do application development in our respective companies. But yes, it's very much applicable in anywhere. Gaurav says, how much automation knowledge is important for BA? So frankly, Gaurav, you, it's good to have, but it's not mandatory at all. Automation is something which is deciphered once you start understanding that what is the process that runs today and what is the automation you need to bring in for tomorrow. Now, in terms of automating, you will have multiple inputs coming in from various people. You're not an automator as you say, it's not really necessary for you to be one before you become a leader. Okay, question from Navita. I think, yeah, Navita says I have a career uh, gap. So, Navita, this doesn't matter. Because you have development and testing experiences, don't forget, I can create a BA out of you who not only can understand requirements, but can also quickly write technical specs for it and test it also as well. So you'll be a BA with multiple skill sets. Again, very, very significant contribution if a BA can step beyond his business analysis and he can step into design and development and testing as well. So the chances for you to, if you're a qualified BA, for example, if you do a qualified course, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for you. Deepak says, I am from computer background, but I don't know IT too much. Yeah? And I don't have a specific uh, thing about programming. Okay, so Deepak, I don't need you to know programming to become a BA. I don't need you to, become a, to be a configurator to become a BA. Please appreciate that business analyst is more trained on the business side. He interacts with business people, he interacts with the business methodologies, he interacts with the business wins, he interacts with the business costs and benefits. Now, but you are the intermediate between business view and the IT view. If you have the IT view, it will be good for you to talk to the clients and satisfy them better. But if you don't have the IT view, it's no problem because the IT team sitting next to you will always fill you up with the right kind of knowledge so you can go back Navigate the business and activity cycle to present a good business case to your team. Okay, two business analysts should normally know. Well, guys, I think it's business process design. For example, tools like Visio, etc., these can be helpful because you use them a lot in terms of drawing your process flows. From that, there are other, other certain tools, but you can learn when you can probably get into a BA certification course. And the study says any resistance in sharing information during requirement gathering. So no, there is no resistance actually because you are supposed to share uh, information. Only then study you will be able to develop the requirements to its highest possible level. So you need to interact with a lot of people, you need to get into war rooms, into conference rooms, into multiple discussions and interviews and, uh, and during a very broad detailing of requirements you build them up.
Okay, Ajay says if BA requirement gathering is incorrect, well, I said Ajay that you know, if requirement is incorrect, then we then the design will be incorrect. So requirements have to be right. But there are so many filters criteria for developing the requirements and normally they don't go wrong. Okay, uh, Rajesh says certification which will be useful for freshers. So Rajesh, for example, I mean, uh, like for example, Imartical is doing this webinar. So I would like to say that Imartical is a very credible uh, institute in today's market, for example, for BA courses. So they offer a BA course, it is also online, it is also in premises, whichever you want to choose. Yeah, so they run in premise courses in Mumbai, Bangalore, etc. But they also run a, 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 a online course which they call CBA. So it's a 40 hour kind of a course, short and sweet, which gives you multiple dimensions to understand about the CBA profile, the tools, the techniques, the way he has to work, who he interacts with, and how does he do his daily walk of life. So that 40 hour course of all CBA course is pretty good, I guess, to you know, know and get into a BA cycle and probably start your career as a BA. Okay, so maybe please, what is entity and exit? So if the entrance state, then the business, uh, the canal in the beginning is the entry, uh, you know, criteria. So for entering into an SDCC, SDCC, you must have some requirements. Exit criteria is when you deploy that to client product. Remember, SDCC have gone through complete testing and passed out for the test results and the exit criteria frankly, UAT, which is a user acceptance as well. That's the last exit criteria for the Yeah, Kalindi, Kalindi, yeah, it's, it's a course called CBA. BACP is intermise course, CBA is online course. So you may like to use any one of them. When you say what is good, I will say both are good, but the BACP is an 80 hour course which they do in premise. CBA is a 40 hour course which they do online. Course content is pretty much the same. It depends on you which one, which is the one which you can enjoy better. Whether in premise in a classroom or you can think that being online is good enough. So obviously the cost uh, is different for the two courses. Yeah, for CBA it's cheaper. Manoj, I'm sorry, but what is STLC? So Deepak, for freshers, I will say either CBA course, yeah. So that's a business analysis certification course, CBA. You can either check that from, uh, you know, from from Tanaz, etc. Who uh, probably you can, if you may like to do from your articles, it's one of the leading institutes for for making you, you know, your start your careers as BA. Yeah, so. So you may probably like to check on that in case you're interested here. In testing cycles, we made BA helps in writing the test cases. He helps in writing the test plan and he sometimes also helps in doing testing as well. So since he understands the requirement perspective very well, in case of a ready developed script for doing testing, that's something which he can contribute pretty well. So it's an add-on contribution from a BA apart from the Analysis of business. Yeah. ITIM normally gives a good knowledge uh, the way the IT curve runs. So it's, it's a good way. It's a good way in case of ITIM. I would not say there is what is the most important stage, guys. Every stage is critical. If the requirements are incorrect, then further stages will be wrong. Even if requirements are correct, but the design goes wrong, then the development and testing will go wrong. So I will not place any one particular you know point on any stage. All phases are interconnected. All phases are highly dependent on each other. So I will say every phase is very important. But obviously, since it all begins with business analysis, I will say that is obviously one of the very highly critical stages. Guys, I think we have just shot our time. In case you still have some questions, maybe I think Tanaz can gather that from you and maybe Tanaz you can send me offline, probably I'll write a quick response for that, you know, on the email 
shoot it back to you and then you can probably spread it down to the participants through an email or something like that. Yeah? Yes. Right? Pleasure being with you. So look forward that uh, you may like to do business analysis as business analysis as well for it. So I think we are here to help you out, to shape you up. And we have done that in now multiple, multiple sessions of batches of people over the last maybe at least now a year or two years now. So, and you can check with the articles for the details. Yeah? Glad to be with you guys and thank you for your time and attention.